here's a statistic that got to me. 70% of people over the age of 45 in Ontario alone are living with two or more chronic conditions, complex chronic disease. But however, persons like myself of whatever age, younger or older, are living active and full lives. Now, I'll be 70 next year, which somebody very sweetly told me is really the new 50s. <laughs> I like that, having just lived through the new 40s. But can you imagine how much more can be done for those of us presently who are less fortunate than myself? Imagine in the future, which is now, when Bridgepoint fulfills its mandate, which will happen, to treat complex chronic disease under one roof, with a trained team of experts working together on the whole person, with research guiding each person so they can see that they are dealing with a whole human being. How many more will have such a lucky life as I am having now? I can't tell you what it means to me that you are here. I also want to say uh, very much that this book, which I called Not Yet, because I'm still here, uh, <laughs> Sounds like one of those uh, strippers, you know, who sing in uh, Stephen Sondheim musical. I'm still here. Uh, what is so amazing is that um, I visit friends now that are in Bridgepoint, and I can see the changes happening. I can see the variety of help that was there always, but now the coordination and the understanding of working together. Uh, and. Uh, you know, working with each other in research is making a powerful difference. I'm reading some raw material from uh, my book, uh, my new book. This is raw material because this came to me as in a dream when I was struggling about how to write about the situation when I found I was having to learn how to walk again and so on, uh, what it was all about. And this sequence came to me in a dream. It's not edited sharply because um, that one will be published in March. I thought I would just share with you some of the raw thinking that goes into this sequence, which was simply, there I was in a kind of semi-lockdown ward, locked in ward, and uh, with uh, brain damaged people, people of all ages who were recovering from uh, comas and so on and so forth, and we were under 24-hour observation. And my goddaughter then was back in Arizona, and she phoned. And there I was in the hospital, and she phoned. Tosh phoned during a break in her shift as the supervising nurse at the university hospital. Wason, she said, Mom and Dad tell me you're getting better every day, but Mom says you look terrible, like a skeleton. Her professional tone snapped into place. Eat more. The skeleton ate. Two days later, she caught again. I'm keeping track of you with one of the nurses at the front desk. Now get up and use that walker. Do your full 30 minutes three times a day. I got up, used the thing. I practiced with it every chance my body, my energy would allow. I stood up straight, turned my body, then lifted and turned the walker in the same direction and made quick, shaky footfalls. At first, I sounded like I was frantically rattling a birdcage. Don't lean down like that, the therapist instructed. Trust yourself to stand up on your own. Pretend the walker isn't even there. I did. Soon I could soundlessly lift the contraption, let it down without leaning on it, and head urgently into the washroom. Finally, I had passed, I thought, all the variety of memory and manual dexterity tests. One of the therapists had earlier explained to me how the disconnected brain messages, the result of my having been under semi-conscious sedation for 11 days and nights, were now quickly finding their way right back to the muscles. The more I did, the more I practiced, the more the messages traveling from my brain were reconnecting with familiar pathways. I practiced every waking moment. I stepped out into the long, wide hair hallway with my walker and lifted the contraption past shuffling crones and youngsters staring at ghost companions, past brain-damaged patients of every age, their eyes hollowed, their tongues stilled, and however unjust, their sad condition emboldened me to work harder on my own recovery. 
My arms and legs, fingers and toes began harmoniously to flex at my command. The cleaning staff gave me discreet thumbs up and the nurses encouraging smiles. They reminded me of the elders of Chinatown, those pioneers of tough times who took on any job that paid them the few dollars to buy enough food for themselves and their families to survive just one more day and the few pennies they could send back to China. These were the ones who fought against unjust racist laws and fought back again and again to retain their dignity. And I remember their chant, never surrender. Once, I didn't make it to the toilet and wet the floor. But I wasn't the only patient with that problem. Amazingly, someone would quickly appear with a mop and bucket to clean up the mess. And once again, I missed up twice. Oh, no worry, sir, Martin told me. His dark skin glowed and his accent sang the Caribbean merriment. Can happen me too. A Filipino nurse came and washed me down in the shower. Though I knew better, I felt a little ashamed about the mishap. I confessed to my extended family what happened to me in the hallway. Angels work here, Marie commented. I'm not religious, but I know angels when I see them. Wayson, Jean said, you had two angels in the ICU named Michael and Treasure. Didn't Treasure have a perfect name, Gary said. I remember Treasure, Mary Jo said. Carl said, she was wonderful. My extended family smiled. Everyone's face turned to me. I looked blankly at them. I felt badly. I couldn't remember treasure at all. Surely there was going to be a penance demanded of me who had been given so much. So many of treasure's patients in that ward must fail to remember her. Under sedation, unconscious, and nearly dying, patients like me must trust dozens of unseen hands, experts or ordinary, to deliver us from the dark. And what of all those unknown persons who handle the paperwork, the record keepers and accountants? What of those who clean and cook, wash and scrub, those who deal with the politics of running a hospital, the donors, and those who sat on committees night and day? How can one lose faith? in these networks of compassion that survive famine and wars and revolutions to salvage the lights of me. Many times I stood in my walker and stared in guilt-ridden awe of the nurses who took on the challenge of their countless diapered patients, observed with wonderment how the trained orderlies calmed untenable situations and watched with reverence the cleaning staff mopping up endlessly without hesitations as the doctors rushed on and rushed by to, to look after their patients. The knowledge that the best of them would never earn a fair enough salary to do the work they did only deepened my admiration. For however much money that they would pay me, I could never take on the challenge of their jobs. I could never look after the likes of someone like me. My God, how can anyone stand to work here every day, I thought. And a scream suddenly came from one of the far rooms. A maudlin, self-pitying thought gripped me. We're the living dead, I thought. Dump us into the sea. And then Martin gave me his thumbs up and his broadest no-problem smile, and my spine stiffened. I took another step, then another and another. It felt to me as if my fellow patients and I were on a collective pilgrimage. We disabled, malfunctioning patients, many discarded by the world, mute or babbling, stomped, strode, walked and stumbled up and down the halls. And whether we knew it or not, each step we took was lifted and set down onto the wings of angels. Thank you.